There's prosperity consciousness, and then there's not doing the things that you need to do to call in the money. There's an intersection, an integration between clarity, like putting a demand on the universe and saying, this is what I'm worth. This is what I'm demanding by my actions. And then you see people do that and then go bankrupt, or they do that and they don't then allow for the receiving side of things. So it's really important to move through that terror barrier. I'm Amira Alvarez. I am the founder and CEO of The Unstoppable Woman, a coaching company dedicated to the ultra successful woman. And I'm also the host of this podcast where we expand the conversation about what it means to be a successful woman, the ambition, the power, the drive. And we dive into what it takes to claim your unique power and really create an exquisite life. Today, I have a high energy woman on the podcast, Kara Vival. Kara is known as the laptop lifestyle lawyer. She is an author, a keynote speaker, the president of Vival Law, a personal injury law firm, and the CEO of the Empowerment Institute, LLC, an educational and empowerment platform geared towards delivering courses, training, and coaching to students eager to create their best life. Kara is a graduate from Nova Southeastern University Shepherd Bra Law Center in 2008. Kara is someone who subscribes to the belief that when you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Hallelujah, right? Okay, well, we talked about the idea of hustling, our drivers and motivations for building successful businesses, and the nuances of toxic people, energy, and ideas in your life, and so much more. So without further ado, let's get to the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Kara. So good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Okay, well, let's get started. So I'm going to just dive right into this idea of the the laptop lifestyle. So this is from from I have I've kind of like the pre-COVID, post-COVID perspective on this. Pre-COVID, you know. It was novel. It was, you were a digital nomad if you were just traveling and, you know, not quote unquote stuck in an office. I don't think that's necessarily true that you get stuck there, but you were location non specific. And then there was post COVID where so many people learned that they could work from their home office and didn't have to be in the office. And that opened up a whole world of experience for people. I'm curious when you entered this world and what it means to you to have a laptop lifestyle. I became a laptop lifestyle lawyer 15 years ago out of need, right? It was, it, there was no lifestyle really to it back then. It was, um, I, I had my son and I was a brand new mom straight out of law school. And uh, I actually didn't even know if I had passed the bar exam yet when I found out I had passed my pregnancy test. And I had this job with an attorney. And uh, he, when I did come out of the closet and told him that I was pregnant, completely changed. You know, this was someone that I had hoped to work with possibly make partner, you know, and just the attitude towards my pregnancy was so negative that the following nine months were really a drag for me going to work. And I got to a point where I was like, is this it? Like I went to seven years of higher education, took a bar exam that took everything out of me. And I'm making less money that I was making prior to going to law school at this job. And I'm miserable. And I got no flexibility. I've got to be at work um, on the other side of town early in the morning. If I'm three minutes late, I'm getting the side eye and I'm getting the, you know, what what happened to you and why are you three minutes late? Meanwhile, I'm an attorney. It was just one of those kind of like moments of what did I do? And I'm in so much debt now. <laughs> this was So that's where I found myself. And so how I became a laptop lifestyle lawyer is I had my son. I didn't want to go back to work after the three months um, unpaid leave that they gave me. And I um, 
kind of was praying to God for a solution. And it came in the form of a woman offering me a facial with Mary Kay Cosmetics at a Target. And lo and behold, at the end of that facial, uh, I became a Mary Kay consultant for a hundred bucks. I always say I bought my freedom for a hundred dollars because that was the cost of my starter kit. And um, fast forward uh, off of that Mary Kay beauty business, I was able to start my law firm and um, I use that direct sales kind of network marketing model to set up my firm because I realized the office was optional. I could meet my clients at Starbucks. I could meet my clients in, at uh, Panera. I could meet my clients even on Zoom and service them and be able to pass on the savings of my low overhead to them. And they didn't mind. The only people who had a problem with how I did my, how I delivered my legal services were really my colleagues in the industry kind of looking at me like I was lesser than. But I also knew that I wasn't missing out on my kids' milestones. I wasn't missing out on my son taking his first steps. I could, you know, if if they called me from the daycare, um, you know, if I did decide to put him there for a little bit, I would go and I could do that in the middle of the day and no one would tell me that I couldn't. I just, and my son actually didn't even go to school and daycare until he was 22 months. And that was because like, I, I really felt like it was about that time. And it was a choice that I had. So post COVID, everyone and their mother, including those who thought that what I was doing was not so sexy before, found my method pretty darn sexy. COVID put it in everybody's face that you really don't need the office. You don't need the the big, you know, leather couch and, you know, the receptionist and all of that. That could be your, you know, a virtual person picking up your phone. Mm -hmm. And so from there, my program really has become kind of like a safe haven for the attorneys who are ready to just do that, you know, make that transition yeah. and really needing to, to put their foundational pieces. And then that's what I, I help them do. So there are a few things that I want to really dig into there. That's a great story. I love, I love hearing the origin stories. What, what I'm picking up on is that freedom and choice are big values for you. And, right. and that you had the chutzpah to actually pursue it, like actually go for it. And I think that's the case with a lot of high achievers is that they, they have a certain amount of risk tolerance they're willing to, to experience in order to achieve what they really want to achieve, which for you sounded like freedom, choice lifestyle, all of that. I, I want to go back to, to one aspect of this story, which is the, the Mary Kay moment. Okay. It's I like, love this. It's so, the most so, unconventional way to start a law firm. <laughs> right. But, but I, I love this. So tell me about, so when I think of something like Mary Kay and the, the ability to make it actually make money doing this, as opposed to not make money doing this, there's, a couple of things that pop for me. One, being great with people, being someone who's really good with connecting with people, which which then allows you to be really good at making sales. Am I right about that, that you had some of those natural tendencies or did you have to, did you have to learn them or uh, improve upon them? I mean, I think I'm naturally, I read people, I connect with people. I love people. I love people. And I've had to learn to tone that down a bit because, you know, sometimes I love too fast, right? <laughs> and so, you know, over time- well, wait, 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 let's not skip over that. What does that mean you love too fast? Is that like employees or friends? Anybody, or anybody. I'm, I'm a benefit of the doubt on steroids um, kind of girl. Like I don't see red flags because uh, I don't, I don't come with red flags, you know, I'm open hearted. I have good intentions. So sometimes I think everybody has the same mm. kind of intentions and you know, it's just not the case. It, yeah. When has that wrong. gotten in the way? When, when have you found yourself this? I mean, just yesterday I was talking to a, a private client about this and, and, and helping her recognize her pattern and what signs to pick up on when someone is, is a uh, red light versus green light for her because she has a pattern of, of 
leaning in when it's inappropriate. So tell me, tell me what's happened for you. Well, I've gotten burned enough times, you know, you get burnt enough times, you start realizing that your approach is not working for you. And so, um, I mean, we could go down a complete rabbit hole of, you know, my what my divorce has, you know, taught me loss of friends, relationships that, you know, didn't work out where when I look back, the red flags were there. I just chose not to see them because I just wanted the connection. And one of the things that I've learned about myself is I tend to project onto people characteristics that might not even be there just to be able to maintain relationships with them because I like them. Mm. But um, really the, the red flags, they're there. We yeah, just I think choose that's... not to look at them or choose to, you know, rationalize them. And I am a good, I realized I was an expert rationalizer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I, will well, have, well I will have the devil well in my house and I'm like, oh no, those horns, they're not, they're just, <laughs> you know, it's, it's to sustain the halo, you know, like yeah. I will make something out of and it's it it's it was always to my detriment. I think one of the thing thing key things that I picked up on in what you just said was that you were trying to maintain the connection no matter what, right? And right. this is I think a big one not just for women but especially for women because our our physiology, our biology, our our upbringing creates a like a primacy for connection. Like that's how we know. I was reading a, a great book called The uh, the Female Brain. We'll put a, a link in the show notes. I can't remember the author. She wrote The Male Brain too, which also was fascinating. But she talked about how females bond in groups and right. that part of the reason, you know, we go to the bathroom together and we we want to socialize and 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 hang out together is because that's how we knew we were going to be safe that the other women would have our backs when we were, you know, menstruating or, you know, with with baby and, you know, couldn't fend for ourselves for instance for for any reason. And I found that fascinating because when I see things like this like you just mentioned, you know, I have this aptitude or maybe it's a detriment, but I put connection above everything else. This is, this is a really interesting sort of biological based, but culturally supported aspect of our, our, our way of being. And if we're not, if we, if we don't have discernment around it, then we get ourselves in trouble because we're just right. doing it across the board. So I want to go I back mean, to it really only comes after enough, uh, unfortunate experiences. Um, I don't think that, you know, a lot of what I now, you know, 2020, what do I say? Hindsight is 2020. I realize now, yeah, I could have seen that. I should have seen that, but really could have, could I have, like, I couldn't have. Cause I, you know, I really think about it. I, where I was at the time, the vulnerability, the, you know, being so gullible at the time, it's just part of the evolution of that female brain. And then you eventually get here to where I'm saying now I have filters, right? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. Wake yeah. up. Absolutely. So experience is definitely one of the best teachers that we have for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then learning from others as well. Right. Like, right, right. Like let this, if someone's listening to this and going, Oh, that's me that you can learn from, from other people's examples. And I think that's, what's beautiful about you know, conversations on podcasts is that we get to listen in and hear how other people have navigated things. I want to go back to um, one of the this the the things you said previously about your desire to, you know, have the freedom, have the choice, stay home, have that lifestyle freedom. Why do you think it's crucial for women in general, but specifically highly ambitious women to really go after what's true and right for them. I'm about two things. 
I'm about women, financial and emotional independence. That's really what I stand for. That's what my work is all about. And I believe that to even achieve emotional independence, a woman needs to be financially independent. I don't think there's any way around that. As long as your survival is dependent upon someone else, there's just work that you need to do on yourself to attain, you know, to ascend in the emotional realm and the spiritual realm realm that becomes challenged. And so uh, for me, being able to financially sustain myself and not be at the helm of someone having to write a paycheck for me or telling me where to be or when to be. It, it it was obvious during my first nine months working because of how just unaligned I was. I was just not myself. I was uncomfortable. I was fight or flight. I, I you know, that was the feeling, the, the predominant feeling in my body and my being. And I knew that that was not sustainable for me. I, I, that was one thing that I never normalized. I never said, oh, that's okay. It's going to get better. No, I was just, you you don't have to tell me twice on this. This does not feel good. And, um, I've been my entire life going towards what feels better. And I've done the work to continually go towards what feels better because, I mean, I've been through so many fires that I'm not going to voluntarily in, you know, add more into my life. I try to, you know, go where I'm wanted, going, go where things are, are more peaceful for me so that I can live the the few days. Okay. So let me just go back to give you some perspective on also my mindset, because you asked me about how I am as a person connecting with people and all of that. One of the things that I'm very present to, um, in this is how fragile life is Mm -hmm. and how little time we have and that we are all here on borrowed time. You know, my father was taken out of the game at 42 years old. I will be 42 this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm very present to, The fact that we just have, and my book, 28,000 Days, Make Yours Count, was exactly for that. You have uh, about 28,000 days out here to do this human dance, okay? And so this idea that you have time is a complete illusion. It's really an an illusion. My dad, the morning that he was, I mean, he was assassinated back home in Haiti. That's what happened. That morning, this man woke up with many dreams, much vision, big ones of things that he was going to do for his wife, for his kids, for his family. And by 11 o'clock that Saturday morning, he was no longer with us. And so to be clear, I wake up every day with a fire that I am not here forever. And Mm -hmm. whatever it is that I want to do with this person that I get to be during these 28,000 days of mine, I'm going to go at it full throttle every day. So I am not going to allow myself to be in anything that doesn't feel good because why? I don't have enough time to Mm -hmm. feel bad. I want to feel good as much as I can. Because what, why would I do the? Why would I do the opposite? It's not. It's not worth my time. What a great uh, lesson and meaning to pull out of. Quite frankly, a, a tragic experience. Can you share just briefly why your what what the context was of your father being assassinated? What was the? He was working back home in Haiti in a coffee. It was a coffee company and where they where the they had the coffee plantations um the speculators it's it's really coffee business type stuff the speculators would sell the coffee while it was wet to the vendors and so obviously it weighs more when it's wet so my dad's job was to go in those areas and install dryers and so by doing that he basically put his hands in the pockets of the people who were selling it wet and they didn't like it. And so there was a, Mm. basically they, they plotted to take him out and, and they succeeded. It was, it was financially driven. It was financially Um, driven. And so, and it was at a job. It wasn't even his business. It was, has, did that, did the fact that it was financially driven have any effect on you in terms of business or money, your perspective on either of those two things? 
No, I mean, you could do good for money and with money and you could do bad for money and with money. It really has nothing to do with that. For me, money is a tool. Money allows me to have access to places that I would otherwise not eat foods that I would otherwise not be able Mm. to take my kids to school and expose them to things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. It's a tool. You know, I went yesterday to the store. I wanted a nice pair of Chanel's and money was able to buy that. And I didn't have to deny myself that. Did I need it? Probably not. But, you know, I don't have to deny myself things that I want. And so I want to make enough of it that I don't have to deny myself or my kids. Absolutely. hundred percent. I want to go back to one of the things that we were talking about a few minutes ago, which was that the connection between financial freedom and emotional freedom. And I think that there are a lot of women who are uber successful, you know, making multiple millions, running big businesses, doing things that provide a significant income for themselves. And they still feel emotionally trapped because they feel competent in the their ability to make money in their masculine but they don't necessarily feel confident or competent in relationships and and secure and feeling loved and whole in these other areas of their life and i I just want to like open that conversation a little bit more because i certainly understand because i didn't you know i didn't get birthed into making lots of money. I I started in a place where I was really making money as a response to feeling like I didn't have enough of it, right? Like feeling trapped that I couldn't buy the pretty clothes. That was a big thing for me. Same. Same. I had, yeah. And I could give you my, I could give you my origin story around that. Right. Right. Where it was like, okay, now you really need to change this because this is not working. Like because broke does not look good on me at all. Yeah. And I'm not nice when I'm, you know, when I don't have enough. So then, yeah, I, yeah, I got hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I definitely understand that and feeling trapped and, and like that security came from the relationship that I was in, not just emotionally, but financially as well. Like we were in it together kind of thing. Then I realized that that was a, like a false wasn't that I didn't truly have love. I might not have really known what love was, but it wasn't that it was a inauthentic relationship. It was an authentic relationship. But I realized that I was looking to that relationship for emotional security, not just financial security. And when I started to make more money and that relationship dissipated, not because I was making more money, just a point of clarification for everyone, uh, but for other reasons, I then had to learn how to be emotionally resilient, capable of receiving love and giving love as someone who had put all her focus into building a business. And I think there's like a, it can be a a little dance there. Like you put all your effort into financial security, but then you, then you have to figure out the emotional. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have emotional security or a great relationship or great connection? So my emotional security did not have anything to do with my financial security. I was financially secure in a very detrimental marriage. Honestly, I always could go back to thinking that I was single married, right? I was married, but I I was living my single, you know, I was a single mom taking care of my kids, taking care of everything. And I, I had a, I had a partner. I had someone that I was married to, but really was not watering my grass, right? The way that I would have needed it. And I made him wrong for a lot of things that now I've taken full responsibility that were never his responsibility to do. And let me explain. Emotional independence, emotional freedom comes when you fall in love with yourself. Okay. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. When you fall in love with yourself, when you give yourself all those things that you're appealing to other people to give you truth is no one can love you the way you can love yourself and the way you know that you need to be. So let's just pause right there for a moment. So I think this is one of the really profound thing that you're saying and something that needs to be fleshed out a little bit more, especially for people who are always in go mode around their life and their business right? Like how do you bring love into your life 
on the daily? Like what is, what are your processes for this? Oh, and how I, does it affect your, and, and let's connect the dots for people because it's sure. affected my business bottom line very well, significantly. How has it right. affected yours? Yeah. Well, first of all, my standards have gone way higher, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I know that I'm worthy of a lot more mm -hmm. than I was the breadcrumbs I was accepting. And when I go back, sometimes I think, what the heck was I doing in this for so long? And what the heck, how did I even allow Do you this? you find person? that you justified it? I found like I justified the- Absolutely. The Again, because I was prior, I put connection before me. You heard me. Like I put connection with someone else before myself, before my needs, before mm -hmm. how I really felt. And that was definitely a lack of self-love. It was a lack of self-worth. It was a lack of self-respect. I had low self-esteem, even though I was a professional, beautiful, successful on the outside, kicking butt, author, this, that, the package. When you look at my page on, you know, whatever, I was that girl. Mm -hmm. But evidently I didn't get the memo because I was accepting crap in my life. One of the, you know, I talk a lot about these shadows of success, like th that we, we have core wounds that we are trying to fill and that they become this shadow to success, right? Like we're trying to fill them. We're chasing different things in life in order to fill the void that these traumas, these core wounds cause in us. And my core wound was unlovability. And it sounds like yours is very similar, like that, that like I looked like I had my together, but I was on the inside very much trying to soothe a sense of not feeling loved. And there was this part of me that felt like if I actually solved that, not consciously, this is completely subconscious, but that if I actually solved that, that I would lose my ambition. Like I would lose the thing that caused me to be so successful in life because it was the thing that, that drove me. Right. Did you have right. any of that? Well, no, because now that, and I know you'll totally relate now that I'm in this space, instead of chasing the thing, it's like the thing is now chasing me. Yeah. Because I can sit here in my whole worthy self, in my whole mm. skin and be where I am, do what I do and the opportunities, everything just comes and, and, and gets magnetized to me versus me having to go out and chase it fight or flight mode. And mm. so how this self-love and, you know, embrace me embracing my whole self. And unapologetically and allowing myself to come out of my shell as who I really am, not dialing myself down or, you know, adjusting the temperature to the room or whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, and so not doing that has allowed the things that are really meant for me, the abundance that is really meant for me to just find me. And it mm -hmm. finds me all the time. Like you found me to bring me onto your platform. And that's part of what's happening is the shift in from me going out and chasing to being found and opportunities coming. And it only comes once you are in a vibrational space of oneness and love of self knowing that you're worthy, that you can show up on anyone's platform and give of yourself from the essence of you, holding nothing back and that it's good. This is the law of vibration says you will magnetize to you, you will attract to you that which is on the same vibration that you're on. So if you, if you want bigger, greater things, you need to be, you need to get on the vibration of that. It does come with loss to rise to the next vibrational space that is going to bring all of that. Mm. There are people, things and places and habits and all that, that need to go and Absolutely. they have to fall off. You cannot rise heavy, yeah. right? You only rise light. And that's the law of sacrifice. You have to let go of something of a lower nature to let in something of a higher nature. Very important because, you know, it's like people are holding on tight to this little comfort mm -hmm. zone of, you know, all of the things that, you know, they, it, it, it's it's good. It's not great, but it's good to have a great life. You have to let go of the good life. 
Yeah. And to have an exquisite life, you have to let go, go of the great life. Like absolutely. You know, yeah. <laughs> that part. So uh, let's go back to the, 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 the question, several points before, which was, what did you do personally, specifically, tactically to own, own that worth and love yourself? Like, what does that look like for you? Like, what did you have to do to really shift that for yourself? First of all, I started prioritizing myself. If saying yes to you meant saying no to me, it's a no for you. I started mm -hmm. saying yes to myself. If someone wants time with me and I really don't feel like hanging out with that person, I'd say, you know what, before I would say, all right, sure, you know, and then I would just sit there the whole time. Like, why am I here? No, it's a no now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I work out a lot. I spend a lot of time taking care of my body. I'm very picky with what I put in my body, what I put in my mouth. Um, Let's talk about those things because I heard you say that your father died at 42 and I'm like, oh, she's like, she's prioritizing her health and you just for sure. em you emphasize that. So what I was that just on the like? Peloton before coming here. Let's dive into that because I think a lot of women are interested. This is a little bit of a, a tangent, but, a, you know, part of having an exquisite life, part of feeling lit up, part of feeling totally in love with life is feeling good in your body and feeling like having vitality and feeling sexy and feeling strong and, and all of that. And I think it's, it's important to unpack what, what people do specifically. So tell us about your workout routine. Tell us By about what, way, how it is not a tangent. It is yeah. the main issue. Mm, interesting. Care, it's not a tangent. Taking yeah. care of yourself, feeding yourself properly, not putting toxins in your body mm. tells it sends a message to yourself. It sends a love message to yourself, yeah. taking care of you. By the way, I was a heavy drinker throughout mm. my entire divorce process, post divorce. I mean, dark, dark moments. And I was hitting that wine bottle. I couldn't have a glass without doing the bottle. And mm. so trust me. And then I realized I was destroying myself. Mm -hmm. And so out of love for myself, I stopped. I didn't go to a, a meeting. I didn't go to, you know, I didn't have to do a rehab. I didn't do anything. I mean, I was never declared an alcoholic, but I damn sure think I was at this point because of the amount of it mm -hmm. I was assuming to really numb. Right. But then once I allowed myself to feel the feelings, hurt the hurt, and transcend that. And I no longer really needed the bottle right. for the, for the healing part out of love for myself, I couldn't consume it anymore. And so when I talk about the fact that this is not a, a sidebar or, you know, a, a side note, it's the main piece, what you, how you treat your body, how you take care of yourself, the working out. I mean, I went and joined an athletic club nearby and I'm in the sauna three, four times a week. I'm in the steam room. I'm spending time. Like it's not, I can't. I'm we not just bought a sauna and I am a freaking fan. It's like, the best in there every day. It's bread. I should have known a long time ago. So yeah. I'm in there all the time. You know, I, I put my phone on silent. I know I'm a busy journey and all that <laughs> nonsense that people, you have to be on call or whatever. Mm. I'm not performing brain surgery on anybody. And whoever has an agenda that they're trying to infiltrate into mine can wait. I have things I need to do. I have time specifically allotted to return calls to deal with other people's fires, but not interrupting my time is something that I have instituted since this loving myself thing. My kids, I am mom. I love being a, a, a mom. I love my kids, but they know there's a time where it's mommy time. Mm -hmm. I, I go out and I'm like, you see mommy hat comes off. I'm Kara now. I'm going to take a bath. I don't want to talk to you kids. I, unless the house is on fire, do mm -hmm. not come checking for That's me. Great. It's my time. So those are some of the ways that I have prioritized my self-care. Now, very important. The same way that I make sure that my physical diet is on point, my mental diet is on another level. What mm -hmm. I listen to, the books I read, the podcasts I listen to, it's all, you know, it's all jams. If it's not a jam, if it's not giving me that good, good, I don't want it. And so this is the self-love. It's not keeping company with 
you know, energy drainers. It's saying no to the things you don't want and allowing yourself to not feel bad about it, you know, and, and right. And, and yeah. claiming time. I love that. So we're, we, we covered working out, we covered toxins. Don't put toxins in your body. Don't put mental toxins in your body. Don't hang out with hydrate, toxic people. Ounce, hydrate. You know? yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm not into the whole Stanley. That's my daughter's thing. You know, she's 10 and now she's got a, this cup all the time, but I drank three of those a day. That's about a yeah. gallon. So yeah, no hydration is really key. We just, um, I just went down a rabbit hole looking at water filters and how to clean up my water supply, even though I have a beautiful, filter in my fridge and all of that. It doesn't, you know, if you go down that rabbit hole, you'll find out that there's all sorts of heavy metals and microtoxins and plastics in, in the water. And you're like, and in your refrigerator filter, the refrigerator filter does not filter that. So anyways, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I am down a rabbit hole of not using plastics, all of, all of that. Right. And it's, it's so important. And, and this idea of, environmental toxins, I think we need to expand. It's not just microtoxins that that come from the physical environment, but it's also toxic people. There's so many drivers that that blind us. They're like blind spots for really smart women that they can't see when someone is being toxic or when their own thinking is being toxic. And cleaning up your own thinking is a, a huge piece to this. What would be like one or two things in your own thinking that you had to clean up along your journey? First things, let's start with money. I specifically remember the moment where I was like, whatever program I'm running around money is not working for me. I remember I was a full blown professional already. I've had my law firm for a few years and I went to a discount store. It was Ross. I don't know if you know, if you have Ross where you are, mm. but anyways, I go there and I was just buying a couple, you just go some power dresses, you know, for work. And I'm in the line and I'm literally figure I'm thinking like, is my card going to go through? Because she's, she's charged. She's putting these, you know, she's adding up these dresses and it's adding up. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this is ridiculous. I'm transferring from one account to the other to make sure my card's going through. And it's not like I'm buying, you know, clothes to go party. This is work clothes and I'm a full. Bl so I was like, there's a conversation I'm having with about money that is not working. And it was a not enough. And so I sat at my kitchen table, I pulled a pen and paper, and I said to myself, what am I running as a program around money that has me consistently creating not enough? Because it's not like I wasn't making money. I, you know, it, it didn't matter how much I made. I always created not enough. And I so want to pause right there. I want everyone to hear some, some people are way beyond this and they've worked through this, but there are many, many women who make hundreds of thousands multiple millions who always run the program of not enough, right? They get themselves in that pattern. So if this is you, listen up here. Okay, please continue. Yeah. And so that's where I was. And I remember when, after my transaction was done, I, I literally was like this, like it was a line in the sand for me. Like I'm not doing this. Anymore. This is, this is not going to be me. And so I sat down and I thought to myself, okay, where is this coming from? Well, I grew up in the most impoverished nation in the Western hemisphere. So of course there was never enough. Then, you know, my father, although he did well after he passed, my mom struggled. And so there wasn't enough. I left home at 16, went to New York and I was hustling because I was alone and it was, you know, 18 credits, three jobs. There was always a hustle, hustle mentality then, you know, so then I started adding it up and it made sense that I would create not enough because that's, that's the program. And so I literally, I remember there was this, um, oh my God, what was his name? Wallace D. Waddles had the science of getting rich. I'm all very aware of that program. I have a whole there is a thinking stuff that. from which all things are made, and which in its right. original state permeates, penetrates, and fills the inner spaces of the universe. When I tell you that I can recite this entire yeah. two-hour syllabus to you, like I mean, 
Mm -hmm. on and on and on. I listened to that and I literally overrode the system and Mm -hmm. I overrode this idea of not enough to an abundance mentality. And then I would force myself to go into expensive stores that I before didn't want to go to. Or I would go to the store and instead of looking to save 10 cents, I'd buy the more expensive item and just, and then it became a habit that I didn't have to look at that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then one thing I realized is the more you act that way, the more the universe supplies for it. So Mm -hmm. it's really not that you have to go make more money. It just somehow comes. I think that there are a lot of women who understand this. They've already mastered this that are listening to this podcast. And then there are a lot of women who haven't yet mastered this and they, you know, I I've, I've, I've helped a lot of them, but there's prosperity consciousness, right? And then there's, but uh, not doing the things that you need to do to call in the money. There's an intersection and integration between clarity, like putting a demand on the, the universe and saying, this is what I'm worth. This is, this is what I'm, I'm demanding by my actions. And then you see people do that and then go bankrupt or they do that and they don't they don't then allow for the receiving side of things so how do you speak to that because i think it's a really important piece i personally have done it more naturally than i think a lot of people have have made that shift and i'd be curious to to hear how you speak to the women for whom that's not a natural like they can't just flip that switch. They, they're they stuck in some way. Start small, start small, incremental, right? And so, oh, but just keep putting whatever faith you you subscribe to, God, the universe, just keep putting it to the test. I promise mm-hmm. you, it always shows up. And so it was honestly, you know, for me, it was always like in buying luxury, right? So I would put it to the test by making like a, I can't believe I just swiped my card for this much for this thing, right? And then seeing the supply come. I remember the first time I went to uh, T. Harv Ecker, he was like a millionaire mine intensive. And then they had they had this, you know, they were doing the, you can buy this course package and it was like 60, it's worth $1 million, and then <laughs> 60 slash blah, blah, blah. And I remember in my heart saying to God, like, man, if this is for me, like make it a price that I, I, I just, you know, and they put $9,997 and I popped out of my seat and I started walking towards the back to go do that. It was the most money I had ever invested in myself at the time. And my knees are shaking. And I'm thinking, what, why did I get up? Like what, like the conversation in my head, the fear, like, oh my God, I'm actually doing this. But guess what? That $10,000 investment in myself has yielded millions it has brought me freedom. The second leg of, it was a five course pack. The second leg of it was um, something called, oh my God, the warrior something. And I went to Fresno. I walked on 30 feet of cold, came back, got divorced. (laughs) So, (laughs) and that was like the best thing that ever Mm -hmm. happened to me, honestly. I mean, Listen, I had a I had a great guy that I was married to, but when the marriage was over, it was over. And it was staying in there was, you know, it, it was just I was my soul was dying. So it's in these little things. It's in investing in yourself a little bit more than you would have. It's getting the extra treatment in your hair. It's, you know, like it's doing those little things for me up until yesterday. Again, I went to a store and I bought something and it was like, I really, this is crazy that I can do that. But I put, and I put God to the test all the time and he never fails to deliver. He comes through. And so I just, now it's it's become a more of a normal, but I still continue to have those fear. You know, those I, I call it that. I think actually Bob Proctor called it the terror barrier, which mm-hmm. is where you have to defeat the fear to go to that next level. It's there, and if you if you jump over, then you've graduated from it. Yeah, because and now the faster you can do that, the the better, right? Big, and so that's big. been my method. It's in going to. Uh, you know, trying a Michelin star restaurant. Yeah, right. I love it. And so, so I think you catch my drift. It's just the yeah. little things here and there, and then they become your new normal. The faster you move through these, these, these places of discomfort, the faster you become 
a person for whom that discomfort does not exist any longer. So it's really important to move through that terror barrier. Okay. What's the number one belief, would you say, that you had to overcome to build this successful business? I had to know that I can. And I knew I could. I knew that. Is that a belief that you had to overcome if you knew that you could? Or is there a different belief that you had to overcome? That I had to overcome to create success. You know, honestly, there were there were different things. There are different voices speaking outside and inside of my own head. You know, like, who am I? I'm a Black woman in South Florida, lawyer. I'm in a male-dominated industry. Like, who am I to go and start my law firm in, you know... This this small laptop lifestyle lawyer way, like who the heck am I? But then I always turned around and said, who am I not? Why not? Why can't I do that? And so I think I've always had two voices in my head, mm. one that was talking to me and another one that was, you know, motivating me. I was back then I was leaning very much into not necessarily church, but, you know, faith. I've always been a faith driven person. And my days in Mary Kay also were very inspiring. Seeing women on these stages collecting million dollar checks. I think a lot of these kinds of barriers that I may have had got broken for me in that process because I I believed that I could, even though I had a lot of naysayers around me. And it's it's been challenging to lose some people or to, I would say, graduate from people and graduate from mm-hmm. environments of the people who didn't necessarily believe or who believed but didn't, didn't want to lose me kind of a thing. But I think that as soon as I... I hate to say it, but it's true. Like as soon as I got divorced and got through that, nothing was impossible to me Mm. because that was like the major, like it was, it was, that was huge. Like I had to really choose myself because it was, you know, I I, I have to stay for the kids and I have to do this. And then finally I was, I I was like, I'm, I'm leaving for the kids. I'm, this is for everybody's, you know, good. Right. And so I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. yeah. (laughs) So when you were looking at the women on stage, when you were doing Mary Kay, who were receiving the million dollar checks, were you saying to yourself, if they can do it, I can do it? Absolutely. Yeah. And and so when, when you think about being a female who has broken through some, some big stories of limitation and is in this male dominated world. And only 2.5% being African, well, black women in general. Yeah, that's huge. So my mother was a lawyer and she's retired now, but she was a lawyer in the sixties and seventies and the eighties. She was one of two, two women in her law, um, law class. And she was pregnant just like you. And she got the business around it as well but it's a the the power of breaking through the 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 judgment that comes with that was was huge for her so when you think about being a a female leader in your your industry and a black female leader in your industry what does that mean to you what like is it is it a important identifying feature or is it something that's just a non it's not present for you? It's not present in my day to day of what I do. I'm not, I'm Mm. not like constantly aware of who I am or, you know, I would just do what I do. However, I think that to whom much is given much is required. And because of who I am and the, and where I come from and the barriers that I've had the blessing to overcome, I do have a responsibility to at least make my story be known as a story of possibility because women who have come before me, like I told you, women like those Mary Kay women, their stories have inspired me. So for me to hide, you know, with my story, not having it be a catalyst for the law student who is right behind me or just a woman who comes from, you know, humble beginnings 
and thinking to herself that, you know, I lost my parents when I was young or I lost, well, I did too, you know? And so I want my story to serve as just a, an example of what's possible because ultimately, isn't that what we're all here to contribute to one another? You know, we are all branches of the same tree. I always say that, right? And so in being branch of the same tree you're attached to, my job is to make myself, you know, open for you to see me and I can see you, I can, you know, leverage you, you can leverage me. And that's the best way to, to interact in this ever, you know, evolving space. And so that's, that's, that's where I'm at. And to be quite honest with you, also for me, I have two kids watching me. <laughs> I, I am setting the example. Like I want my son to know and my daughter to know what a woman who, or anybody really, but in my skin, a woman can do if she puts her mind to it. So really, if they want to achieve anything, it's just a matter of putting your mind to it and get her done. Cause that's what I'm doing. They see mm -hmm. everything. I love it. I love it. Do you, do you self-identify as someone who hustles? Yeah. I used to. And it's so funny that you asked me that because I literally had that conversation like maybe two, three days ago with my coach. And I said, I don't want to be that. That's mm. what got me here. But I certainly, as I go there, and it's not, it's not present for me anymore. Um, the mm -hmm. hustle, I'm aware of the fact that it's no longer present. And it literally kind of just left, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the space that I moved into. And in this space that I'm in, things just come naturally. People, the right people are coming, the right conversations are happening, the right opportunities are coming. They're co they're coming. And I'm very aware of the difference. And mm -hmm. so, and again, what got me here, I understand will not get me there. And for whoever's listening, mm -hmm. if hustle got you here and you're looking to go into ease and grace, there are just a lot of hustle baggages that have to stay in this space so you can ascend to ease and grace. Yeah, absolutely. You can't take hustle with you. You know, there's so many different connotations to the word hustle. And sometimes I have great connotations to it because it's like, I'm in my life force. I'm doing what I love to do. I'm in jam mode. I'm in go mode. And it feels enlivening and great. And then there's hustle with the connotation of like, I'm burning the candles on both ends. I, I don't have a breath to take. I don't feel good in my body because I'm like eating on the run or, you know, not giving myself enough time for sleep or whatever that is. And so hustle, I think, has a lot of different meanings, at least to me. And it's I think it's a really beautiful place that you can get to when you figure out how to bridge that ambition that drives the hustle, right? That and, and step out of being scarcity driven or urgency driven into the ease and grace, the, the spaciousness of receiving and creating at the same time. So I love that. So before I ask my final questions, where can people find you? What's, what's the best place for them to look you up and get to know you? Awesome. Thank you. Well, before I answer that, you said something about sleep talking about what I do to self care and love mm. myself, I sleep a lot more now. Um, yeah. I have a little aura ring and I monitor my sleep and I make sure that I get enough of it. And so for those of you who are taking, you know, getting four or five hours of sleep, sleep a little longer because you need yeah. it. Yeah. I love it. I so love it. That's important. Well, they can find me at, uh, I'm on social media, uh, Cara Vival ESQ and, um, Cara Vival .com, the laptop lifestyle lawyer.com, all of those different places. They can join my community. They can, um, opt in to, to get a copy of my book. So I'm, you know, just, just Google me and you'll find me at this point. Cara Vival ESQ. I love it. How do you create beauty in your life right now? I create beauty by intentionally um, create moments that are going to be memories for a lifetime. So this past um, spring break, I 
took my kids to the Bahamas in Bimini and we did the seaplane and that mm -hmm. was awesome, you know, and we checked that box and then I come back, I have all the pictures, I pop them into this app and I create these albums that come in and we just, you know, constantly watch those. I'm intentional with the time that I spend, whether it be with now my boyfriend, my kids, I spend a lot of time with my kids uh, or with myself. It's, it, it's just everything is intentional. Everything is done with the idea of creating a, a good experience, a good experience for myself, a good experience for whoever's involved with me. So I don't, again, like I said to you, I don't want bad service. If I'm going to a restaurant, I don't want, you know, I don't want bad food. I don't want anything that is sub. So it's important for me that every experience that I create right now in my life is top quality. How would you define an unstoppable woman and what makes you an unstoppable woman? I describe an unstoppable woman as a woman who falls 10 times, gets up 11. That's her. And, and that, and she's me. I am not afraid of failure. I think my approach to failure has very much so um, helped me get to where I am because I embrace failure. I don't, I'm not afraid of it. I don't think of it as being final. I don't allow it to detract me. I don't allow it to, I, I, I'm a learner. And I think an unstoppable woman learns from her mistakes. She learns from her experiences. She doesn't let those experiences define her. And after whatever lesson she's learned, she, impl she implements the unstoppable woman implements and doesn't repeat mistakes over and over. Mm -hmm. She, she keeps graduating and moving forward. And so that's me. That's, I think that's what has made me, I guess, a successful woman. Um, it's the fact that come hell or high water, I'm getting to where I'm going to. And so mm -hmm. if it's, above, through, under, around, however I have to make it there, I'm getting there. Mm, <laughs> and it doesn't it. matter what obstacles come in between. I will, I, I can count on myself to grow from it, learn from it, heal from it and keep it moving. I love it. I love it. So my last question for you, Kara, is very briefly, what advice would you give people for living an exquisite life? Put yourself first. Mm, what a beautiful way to end. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kara, for being here on the podcast with us. Thank you so much for all of you who are listening. It's been a great conversation with Kara. If you liked this podcast, please do us a favor and give it a five-star review, leave a comment, leave a review, uh, share it with people. All of that really helps us build the audience and the listenership for this podcast. And that allows us to bring bigger and bigger names and great guests like Kara onto this podcast. So if you could take a moment and do that, I would be incredibly grateful and appreciative. And Kara, once again, thank you so much for being a guest on the Unstoppable Woman podcast. It's been amazing having you here. Thank you for sharing your stories and your vulnerability and your wisdom. And I hope you and everyone listening has an exquisite day. I'm Amira Alvarez. I'm the founder and CEO of The Unstoppable Woman, and we'll catch you in the next episode. 